A new documentary was recently released called The Mission that tells the story of John Chow. In 2018, Chow, a young American missionary, was killed by arrows while attempting to contact one of the world's most isolated indigenous people on remote North Sentinel Island off the coast of India. The Sentinelese tribe are one of the six native and often reclusive peoples of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, just off the coast of India. Unlike the others, the Sentinelese appear to have consistently refused any interaction with the outside world. They are hostile to outsiders and have killed people who approached or landed on the island. In 1956, the government of India declared North Sentinel Island a tribal reserve and prohibited travel within three nautical miles of it. It further maintains a constant armed patrol in the surrounding waters to prevent intrusions by outsiders. In spite of all this, John Chow expressed a clear desire to convert the tribe to Christianity and was aware of the legal and mortal risk he was taking on by his efforts, writing in his diary, Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have heard or even had the chance to hear your name? The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I think it's worthwhile to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Don't retrieve my body. Chow's death was a tragedy, but it raised some very important ethical, spiritual, and theological questions. Why did John Chow go to the Sentinelese, even though he knew that they didn't wish to be contacted and it could cost him his life? Was what John Chow did ethical? Was there a wiser approach maybe he could have taken? What happens to people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Should we as Christians be attempting to convert those from unreached tribes and indigenous people groups? Well, welcome everybody to the Beards and Bible Podcast. My name is Josh. I'm here. I'm here. It's a bit of a frantic, uh, it was a frantic evening before hopping on, but I'm here, and I'm here with my buddy Gabe. Gabe, how you doing tonight, man? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, you just silenced my phone here. I just forgot. But yeah, oh, you're uh, so popular. Yeah. Your phone's ringing. <sighs> yeah. Well, I remember back in the early days of doing this podcast, we'd have all kinds of weird interruptions going on. Um, <laughs> right now, I've got my three boys and then two additional boys that are doing like a sleepover Ooh. and they're up there playing they're up yeah they're up above me playing uh like the mega jenga just like the big blocks yeah and um every now and then you can hear like their tower just topple down and it's kind of frightening I think the whole <laughs> house is like falling down or something but yeah uh yeah well yeah how are things at the the brooker the brooker stead oh man busy as i'll get out this is like a crazy 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 month for us it just seems like there's so much mm. going on with you know kids dance and then there's this thing in the library we went to tonight where there was a christmas puppet show and then we had a musical at the art center that was you know christmas themed and yeah aiden is doing karate mm. with christ <laughs> hmm. interesting yeah I was telling you, like, go and work out with Jesus. You guys do karate together. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's like a it's like a Christian karate class. So uh, he's all about it. But uh, yeah, you ever feel like just a glorified taxi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you um, you know, if it was if we were recording this any earlier in the day when my brain was was uh, a little bit more fresh, I'd come up with some kind of witty karate Jesus pun. But. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I um, can't do it. You can't do it. Yeah, I can't really think of anything either, other than he mm-hmm. roundhouse kicks sin in the face. Mm. So, if we ever yeah. came up with some uh, beards and Bible merch, maybe that'd be a good, good, good inspiration there. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe yeah, sacrilege. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Um, so I did karate when I was a young, a young man, and I really wanted my dad to do it with me. And my dad's like, I don't really want to do it, but I'll do it with you, son. So dad came to class a couple of times, but you have to wear like a karate gi, you know, like the long Mm -hmm. uniform Mm -hmm. or whatever. And dad was not about like 
you know, sweating and long sleeve gi. So he would wear t-shirts with his karate pants and his karate belt. Mm. And, um, there was a church ministry we had called Carpenter's Crew. And it was mm-hmm. like a, <laughs> it was like a graphic of Jesus holding like a hammer and a ruler, you know, like he was a carpenter. Yeah. And, he, and I remember other other people in the karate class having to like kick at my dad, but they were like, we feel bad because we feel like we're kicking Jesus. So <laughs> that's, that's what I think about when I hear karate with Christ. So mm. yeah. Enough about me though. How's things at the, uh, the Rutledge Hacienda? Doing well, doing well. Uh, we're celebrating our, I got the Hanukkah lit back there. Mm. One, two, three, four, five, six, six night of Hanukkah tonight. So yeah, yeah it's Eight pretty rare nights. that we get to record it. Yeah, I get to record the uh, episode with it burning in the background. So, um, you know, normally it's just sitting back there on a shelf every episode. And now yeah. we get to light it up. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that. Mm. But if you're just listening online, just picture uh, Adam Sandler holding a, <laughs> a Nora <laughs> with it on fire. But um, yeah, just tell me. Well, you can't see my camera, can you? Just tell me if it catches on fire back there. No, I can't see your camera because we turned it off because we don't have good internet where we are. But uh, mm. yeah, if mm-hmm. I hear crackling in the background, I'll know it's not mm-hmm. chestnuts roasting on open yeah. fire. It's your menorah exploding into flames. I like that it's it's a Hanukkah menorah uh, lit and going right in front of a case full of Soviet Union uh, <laughs> medals. <laughs> Like, yeah, uh, there's something. Yeah, there's some intersectionality happening there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I sent you a uh, Instagram reel of Smokey Robinson doing a cameo, mm-hmm. and someone told Smokey Robinson. Of course, we all know Smokey Robinson. Uh, he's he's a was a popular artist in the 1960s, as we know. I, I want to say, mm-hmm. what did Smokey Robinson sing? Smokey Robinson sang. Let's see. We're, we're Googling it because my brain just went blank. It? I should know this. He uh, mm. he sang Cruisin'. He sang... <laughs> <laughs> what else did he sing? I, I want to say the name of the biggest uh, hit for Smokey Robinson is Being With You. Yes. So Smokey Robinson, he's he's known for a lot of things, but one thing that he apparently did not know was mm. the Chanuka. The, not Chanuka, that's what he said. Chanuka, Chanuka, yeah, that's yeah. what it was, yeah. Yeah, someone did a cameo trying to ask Smokey Robinson to wish their loved one a happy Hanukkah, and he said, uh, happy Chanuka. I don't know what Chanuka is, but... <laughs> 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 so Gabe, happy Chanuka, my friend. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, did, you see the one, did you see the one I sent you, a Jack Black doing Bob Ross? Yes, no, that was great. That was great. Oh, that was good. That he was called good. his he called his friend Cal Gas a rap scallion. So that's yeah. worth the price of admission right there. <laughs> so he's like, I just use a sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> right now, there's oh, a UPS yeah. truck driving up my driveway right now. So um, yeah, I'm not gonna get up. So we'll just see if if they know how to just put a package on the porch without me helping them in. So yeah, I'm sure yeah. they can. Why, why don't you invite him in and ask him to be? A guest? a guest on the podcast not only be a guest but actually kind of just lead the discussion on tonight's <laughs> topic which is john chow going to the sentinelese people just yeah. see how much your ups guy can can freestyle it on this particular topic oh man i don't want to put him on the spot and mm. i it's a late night for him too it's almost eight o'clock and these poor guys have been out here burning the midnight yeah. oil you know so mm. and if he's the ups guy i'm thinking he's a super good dude and he coached mm. a really competitive baseball team against my son's team and destroyed us every time, beat us by like 12 runs every single game. And so I'm a mm. little bit hurt and bitter. So I'm kind of looking, licking my wounds. Cause he's What's his a, name? I can't say his name on the podcast. Why not? Just say his, just say his first name. Okay, first name is Jeremy. Name. Jeremy. That's all Jeremy. I'll say. All right. That's all I'll say. I think we should get Jeremy on <laughs> at some point. <laughs> He's a good his, dude. Just, He's just a great guy. Like, totally like put him, him on the spot. Okay. Well, one of these days. One of these days. Well, yeah. t- tonight's topic, I sent you a text because I watched a very, very, very compelling film. Um, and honestly, man, I'll just be honest. Like, I've been processing it ever since. It was pretty mm-hmm. heavy. Like, I don't even know yeah, how. 
I, I really don't know how I felt about it. It's kind of taken me two or three days to kind of just work through some of the, uh, the thoughts on my heart and my mind through it. Um, was that the way it was for you? Yeah. Yeah. I watched it, uh, with Stacy and the boys and, um, yeah, it's heavy. Uh, Stacy and I were just even, gosh, as much as just an hour ago, still talking about it and processing through it. I think there's like the parts with John Chow going to the island and spoiler alert, he dies on the <laughs> island, but yeah. we're processing that, you know, and whether or not he made the right decision, but also we're processing the missionary guy who completely renounces his faith. Yes. Because, remember that part? And he's just kind of like, yep. um, really, really kind of embittered with, um, evangelical Christians and sharing the gospel with people that are unreached and, and kind of like whitewashing cultures and colonizing cultures and that kind of vibe. Yeah. He was, um, yeah, it was just, that, that was really heavy for, for the both of us too, I think. Yeah, man. I, I think that was the hard part for it. Like I felt like they tried to approach the story of John Chow with a lot of compassion, um, trying to explore different angles of it. But ultimately like, you kind of saw the worldview of the filmmakers come out because it's very much like, mm -hmm. Hey, the answer is don't, don't do the great commission. Don't believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. Don't do what Jesus did. Missionaries need to stop going out. People need to stop proselytizing and preaching the gospel. And if, um, there was a part where they called mm -hmm. Christianity a first century myth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's deeply concerning that essentially the, um, the filmmakers, presented Christianity as a form of almost white supremacy that mm -hmm. was, um, you know, just colonizing these indigenous peoples and trying to make them white, uh, which, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a very concerning narrative if that was mm -hmm. part of the agenda of the film. But, um, yeah, I just, it, it, it really messed me up, man. Like it just, so many different things to think about um, in going through it. Um, so it, if you haven't seen the film, um, it tells the story of John Chow, who was an American evangelical Christian missionary. And John Chow in 2018 was killed by the Sentinelese, which they are considered one of the last uncontacted tribes on planet Earth. And uh, he just felt like a call, like he needed to go and he needed to evangelize this unreached, uncontacted people group. And so he went and he was killed. And so the international backlash was pretty significant. And um, yeah, so the film just kind of documents his story, how he ended up going to the Sentinelese, but then interspersed with that is interviews from like an anthropologist and then a guy who was a missionary in Brazil to an unreached people group for, I guess, 30 years. Is that right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And so they're asking this guy who was a missionary, uh, who eventually ended up renouncing his faith, becoming an atheist, getting divorced, not talking to his kids anymore. They're asking this guy, like, what's it like to, be an evangelical Christian that actually believes in the great commission. <laughs> so uh, not exactly a unbiased uh, neutral third party there. So, but um, yeah. What, what was it about um, John Chow's story that uh, you, you thought was interesting? Did you, do you think the documentary painted a picture of him as a reasonable sane human, or do you think it was maybe as a, a bit more mm -hmm. unflattering? Yeah, I think they painted him as a very um, idealist adventurer. Uh, they painted him as someone who kind of had a, a degree of uh, naivete. Is that the word? Mm -hmm. Like kind of a almost like a messiah complex. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know that that's accurate or inaccurate because I I don't know the guy and I don't I don't know the full context of his life and everything yeah. and his personality. Um, that's just how they painted him. Um, true or not, I don't know, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I did a little bit more digging into him and his character and looked at the organization that uh, he partnered with out of Kansas City called All Nations mm -hmm. and listened to an interview from the uh, director of All Nations. And um, 
apparently like uh, one of the blogs that went out after his death called him an adventure blogger. Mm -hmm. Uh, Basically he was like not prepared. He didn't know what he was getting into. He was just one of these kids that wanted to go out with his GoPro and just have an adventure and um, nothing could be farther from the truth. Like he had spent about nine years of his life preparing, studying, talking with other missionaries that had done what it is he was intending to do. He had taken courses in language. He'd taken courses in, um, like he'd become an EMT. He got a college degree in exercise science, uh, all for the purpose of going on this mission. And he'd spent about nine years of his life preparing for it. Mm. So that, that kind of didn't get shown in the documentary as much. They didn't really show that as much. Um, and I think there's probably an agenda behind that somewhere, but, um, but yeah, we'll get into kind of what happened, uh, why it happened, and then just maybe just talk some thoughts about maybe was what he did ethical and was what he did wise. I think those are the two big questions that Christians are wrestling with because, like, we we admire the courage and the obedience of somebody like that. I mean, good Lord, that guy believed Jesus, right? And he was going out and doing what Jesus called him to do. But you watch it as a Christian and you're just going, okay, what he was trying to do is admirable. Yes. And amen to it. But was there perhaps a different way he could have gone about it? That was a bit more ethical or a bit more wise. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel that too, as you were watching it? Yeah. Yeah. You kind of feel like, uh, yeah, he did a lot of preparation, like preparing himself for his arrival on this island and interactions with these people. But it doesn't seem like he did much to prepare them for his arrival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the consistency that Stacy and I, you know, kind of were talking after the film. It's like you look at, um, uh, like, um, into the spear and, Mm -hmm. and Nate, Nate Saint and like those guys, like, yeah, they ended up getting killed on a sandbar on the river by the people they were trying to minister, but it was because of a lie that someone told and shared about them. It was a miscommunication that got them killed, but they had done so much preparation and legwork Hmm. preparing those people for their eventual arrival that it was ultimately successful. And even to this day. So yeah, I don't see that as much with the situation with John Chow. It's like he prepared himself a lot, but he didn't prepare them for his arrival as much. And I don't, I don't know what he could have done differently, but yeah, he didn't do anything really. Hmm. Well, we'll kind of we'll get into that, but uh, let's talk about John Chow. John Chow grew up in Vancouver, Washington. His father was Chinese. His mother was American. Um, part of the documentary is told from his father's um, vantage point. I guess his his father hmm. wrote a letter to the filmmakers and um, an actor did a voiceover and read the letter in a dramatic fashion from John Chow's father. Um, uh, John, John Chow's dad didn't seem especially religious. Um, I don't know if they really said if his mom was or not, but um, mm-hmm. his dad was a Christian, but his dad was not really an evangelical Christian. His dad kind of thought that evangelical Christians were, were nutty and extremists. Mm-hmm. 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 And so that's pretty loud and clear from the documentary from the dad's letter that he was concerned because his son was in evangelical churches and went to an evangelical school. He attended uh, Oral Roberts University. John Chow did. He graduated cum laude in 2014. He got a Bachelor of Science degree in exercise science. And apparently John Chow, his entire childhood, his entire life was fascinated by uh just being an explorer, being an adventurer, going on expeditions. He absolutely loved the movie Into the Spear, um, which tells the story of Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and their mission to uh, the Aka Indians in Ecuador and how they were martyred. Um, I don't remember when that movie came out. Do you remember when that movie came out? Uh, There was like End of the Spear, I think, which came out early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Well, yeah, he was obsessed with that movie because, you know, Jim Elliott was one of his heroes. Nate Sate was one of his heroes. And, of course, they were martyred trying to reach an 
contacted unreached people group in Ecuador. And so he just kind of had this fascination with um, tribal groups like that. And he started doing missions work in 2018 or before 2018, excuse me. He, he went to uh, Mexico, South Africa, Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, he first went to the Andaman Islands in 2015 and 2016. Um, but of course he didn't visit the North Sentinel Island. We'll talk about that island here in a minute. And, um, yeah, he, he just had this desire, this dream to go to uncontacted, unreached people groups and really set his sights on the Sentinel Island. And so in 2017, the year before he was killed, he went to a missionary training organization in Kansas city called all nations. And there was a, um, basically a simulation that this missions group ran for John and the documentary kind of makes it seem kind of silly and ridiculous. Do you remember that part? <laughs> yeah. 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 They kind of role played and came out with like, you know, spears and stuff and would confront the the missionaries in training and yeah. speak like different languages to them, try to confuse them and stress them out and stuff. Yeah. It's kind of like missionary boot camp, you know? Yeah. Which if you're going to an uncontacted people group, how can you practice other than doing that? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can make light of it and make fun of it, but if somebody's preparing to do that, that's pretty much the only way they can prepare. So, um, <clears throat> the, the documentary seemed to, seem to paint the picture. This was like an extremist, you know, extremist group training him for the suicide mission essentially. But, um, yeah, he was very, very, very interested in the North Sentinel islands. Um, and the people that live on the island are called the Sentinelese. So, um, this is what was really interesting about the documentary. I'd never really heard a lot about the, the tribe that he was interested in um, ministering to. So the Sentinelese are one of six native people of the Andaman and Nicobar islands. This is off the coast of India. <clears throat> and a lot of these tribes have, um, interacted with, um, kind of the outside world, modern humanity, but the Sentinelese are hostile to outsiders. Uh, they don't want anybody coming to their Island uh, people who approach the island or land on the shore are killed. They get spears thrown at them. They get bows and arrows thrown at them. And so um, the government of India basically declared North Sentinel Island a tribal reserve, and you can't get anywhere within three nautical miles of it. And mm -hmm. there is an armed patrol in the surrounding waters to prevent any intrusion from any outsiders. Um, you can't even take pictures. And so um, there's really not a lot we know about the Sentinelese. Um, they interview a guy, I guess he was an anthropologist. Try, I've got his name written down on the show notes. Tri Trilo Kanath Pandit. Hmm. If you're Indian, I'm sorry, I just butchered that guy's name. <laughs> hmm. uh, so yeah, in 1991, from about 1991 to 1997, he went over and had some interactions with them. So we don't really know how big this tribe is. Estimates range from as low as 35 people to maybe as high as 500 people. Um, really interesting though. What, what did you find interesting about this people group? Hmm. Yeah, it's just fascinating how isolated they were. I mean, they, they seemed really, uh, seemed like there was one, English explorer who went in and remember it talked about how they, he, he was taking these like uh, kind of these anthropomorphic photos, science, scientific mm -hmm, looking photos mm -hmm. of all these different people and uh, kind of, kind of journaling all this other stuff. But then I guess they abducted a, an entire family and then the parents of that family died in custody mm -hmm, and then they, mm -hmm. they had the kids for a while and they eventually took the kids back. This but was like in the like, 1800s um, when India was a British yeah. colony. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they were talking about how um, any any of the captive Sentinelese people they took, they they died pretty quick. Like uh, they just didn't have immunity to diseases and stuff. So it must mm -hmm. be, you know, a thing in this island. You don't let insiders come on the island because you will die if you get around them. Like they, you know, they just they right. probably don't fully understand the whole thing. But 
thought that was really interesting. They have this very strict uh, kind of code of conduct. You don't let anybody here because you will die if they, if we do. Right, right, right. So that, I mean, that kind of explains why they're so hostile mm-hmm. to outsiders. Cause you know, there's probably the, those stories got passed down from generation to generation to generation, you know, for over right. 150 years. And so, you know, you grew up your whole life hearing, if an outsider comes to this island, you kill him, you don't go with him because you'll die. You know, they're here mm-hmm. to kidnap you and take you. And so, yeah. So, um, these are the people that John Chow felt like they, they've never heard the gospel. They've never heard the name of Jesus. They don't know anything about Christianity. They don't know anything about the outside world. All they know is that Island and what's on that Island. And nobody even knows their language. Nobody understands how their language works. And so he was just absolutely fascinated by this. What's so interesting is they interviewed some of John Chow's friends asking his friends, like, you know, do you think that some of it was the call of the Lord or do you think some of it was John really wanting to do this himself? And even his friends said, we don't know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which is really interesting to me. I, I, I think that there was a lot of uh, kids when you and I were in uh, college, because we both went to a Christian college that was a Pentecostal evangelical Christian college, just like John Chow went to. And you would hear kids always talking about, you know, I just feel called to do this. or I feel called to do that. I feel called to do a water skiing ministry. I feel called to, you know, be in a Christian rock band that plays stadiums. That's just a call of the Lord on my life. And, um, now, 20 years later, I look back and I go, I don't know. I don't know how much of that was the call of God and how much of that was like, you just had youthful ambition and it kind of was in the neighborhood of Christian work. And so it kind of became the call of God. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 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 So a lot of his friends were kind of wrestling with when John Chow would tell him, Hey, he really wants to go to the Sentinelese. God's calling to do it. They're like, well, I mean, he's a very godly young man. He loves Jesus. He believes in missions, but he's also very, 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 very interested in uncontacted peoples and expeditions and adventuring and that kind of thing. So it's kind of that weird line between how much of this is, a call of the Lord and how much of this is just John Chow really wants to do this. Cause it would be really interesting and fascinating. And he would, you know, do something that had never been done essentially. So in October of 2018, he traveled to and established his residence at Port Blair, which is the capital of the Andaman and Nicobar islands. He prepared for, uh, an initial contact by creating a kit that included picture cards for communication, gifts for the Sentinelese people, medical equipment, and other necessities. And um, it was highly illegal to go anywhere near North Sentinel Island. And so he kind of knew that to to do this, he was going to have to break the law. But he wrote in his journal that he thought this North Sentinel Island could have been Satan's last stronghold on earth. And his plan was he was going to go and contact them and then live among them and basically just become one of them, learn their language, learn how they work, basically spend his entire life living among them and sharing the gospel with them. That was his plan. Hmm. Which that's a pretty, um, Unusual thing for a 26-year-old young guy to say he wants to do. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Were you thinking about sure. that when you were 26? Yeah. No, I was definitely not thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. So to get prepared for the trip, he got vaccinated from everything uh, that could possibly be in a system. Because, again, like Gabe said, um, an uncontacted people group, they wouldn't have the kind of immune systems that we do because they haven't been exposed to any diseases that maybe we carry. So what could be just like a minor cold for us could be a death sentence for some of them. Uh, he undertook medical linguistic training and then he paid two fishermen, the equivalent of 335 us dollars to take him near the Island. Uh, later those two fishermen were arrested because they broke the law, taking John Chow near the Island. 
And uh, you you hear in his um, journal kind of what he is wrestling with. This is his journal. Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have heard or even had the chance to hear your name? The in the eternal lives of this tribe uh, is at hand. I think it's worthwhile to declare Jesus to these people. Um, please don't be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Please don't retrieve my body. Hmm. So he kind of knew, like, I'm... I'm risking my life. And uh, yeah, so he went on his first visit in the fishing boat. They took him about 500 meters from the shore, about 1,600 feet. Uh, The fisherman warned him not to go any further, but he got in a canoe and he canoed towards the shore with a waterproof Bible. And this is all detailed in his journal. And I guess the fishermen were there kind of witnessing it. As he approached, he attempted to communicate with the islanders and to offer them gifts, but he retreated He retreated after facing hostile responses, and he recorded in his journal on another visit that the islanders reacted to him with a mixture of amusement, bewilderment, and hostility. Uh, this is what's interesting. He attempted to sing worship songs to them hmm. and to speak to them in a language spoken in southern Africa, after which they often would feel, uh, fall silent. And it's he wrote that attempts to communicate often ended with them bursting into laughter. <laughs> hmm. Wow. So I don't even know how like how he thought that would work. I don't know if it was just like he was hoping that his nonverbal cues they would see that he, you know, wasn't intending to harm them in any way. I don't know. So yeah, the film doesn't really give you an idea how long he's there and how many trips he makes to the island. Uh they don't really explain that. But yeah, so like he goes to the island the first time and it looks like they shoot his Bible and then he retreats and mm-hmm. then it looks like he goes back a second time, but it doesn't say how long he's there. It just, he's just, he's just dead. And so it sounds like based on these accounts that he was there, I don't know, better part of an hour or so before they finally kill him. I, I don't know. What do you think? Um, putting the timeline together is a little, I mean, he, I think he made three visits. So okay. he was killed on November 17th, but I think it was a three-day uh, operation altogether. So he mm. went on November 15th. He went again either the 16th or the 15th, and that's when he got a metal-headed arrow shot at him, and it pierced the Bible he was holding in front of him. He retreated, and then mm. he went one last time on November 17th, and that's we don't know what happened on that because obviously he— wasn't able to write that in his diary, but that's when he was killed. Okay. 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 Interesting. Yeah. So you're right though. If you, you study Nate St. Jim Elliott into the spear guys, right. The contact of the Aka Indians, they had a lot longer of a, um, a period in which they were trying to make initial contact. John Charles was three days, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. So one, one could question the, uh, the strategy of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's tragic that he was killed uh, on November 17th. He told the fishermen to abandon him. He was just going to go. And they were just going to, I mean, for him, it was do or die, right? I mean, it was, he, was, he was done, um, mm-hmm. you know, playing it safe. He just straight up went to the island, and the fishermen later saw the Islanders dragon Chow's body. The next day, they saw his body being buried on the shore. So the news got to Indian authorities. They tried to recover uh, John Chow's body. The tribe wouldn't let him. And then, the, obviously, the news got back to the U.S. And it became international news. And um, all manner of opinions came out. People called him an adventure blogger. People called him a colonialist. People called him this or that. Um, Obviously, Christians uh, admired him for his courage and his obedience and his belief. But at the same time, I think there were several of us that kind of, you know, just felt torn because he thought, you know, did it have to end this way? Could it have gone differently, you know? So, um, 
why don't we explore like why he went, right? What did he believe that would have propelled him to go to this group? So there's a couple of verses. Gabe, you wanna um grab yeah. Matthew twenty eight, nineteen and twenty, and I'll grab Acts one eight and we'll just go back and forth talking about these verses that John Chow obviously knew, studied, memorized. Yeah. So Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, uh, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Yeah. So it says, go and make disciples out of all nations. That word nations is ethnos in the Greek. So, yeah. All ethnicities, every people group, every tribe, every tongue. Uh, Acts 1.8, Jesus says to those at his ascension, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the North Sentinel Island would be considered, I would say, the end of the earth, probably. Mm-hmm. Gabe, will you read yeah, Romans? Romans? Yeah, yeah, go for Romans it. ten fourteen to fifteen. Paul says, "How then can they call on the one they have not believed in, and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news." Yeah, how will they hear unless someone is sent? Which is a very interesting, uh, we'll, we'll break that down here in a minute. And then 1 Corinthians 9.16 says, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So if John Chow believed these verses, Gabe, what would that have meant for him if he believed these verses and took them serious? Yeah, I mean, on a literal level, he would have had to find people like the Sentinelese people and uh and and be moved to deep compassion for them uh and do whatever he could to spread the gospel and make make disciples out of them yeah and i think that's what he did that's how he that's how he viewed these verses that's how he interpreted them and that's how he applied them to his life yeah the big question i think that some people um ask when they see a missionary like John Chow going to an uncontacted, unreached people group is, well, wait a second, what happens to these people who have never heard the gospel? Mm -hmm. So if they died without hearing the name Jesus, then gosh, does that mean that God's going to send them to hell? Mm. Like how could God be a just God and ever do something like that? What in the world does this mean for us theologically? Um, and so I think there's a lot of Christians even that wrestle with that. I've had a lot of people that ask me that, like, hey, what about the, you know, the tribe in the jungle deep in the, uh, you know, heart of Africa? They've never even seen a book. They don't know the Bible. They don't know the name of Jesus. How, how, can, how is God fair in judging and um, pouring his wrath out on people like that? Why would they need the gospel? What would your response be to that if somebody asked you that? Like, why would they need the gospel? Or what is the question again? Like, why, Yeah, why, like what would, happens would God... to those, what happens to people that have never heard the gospel? Like if they die without hearing the gospel in the name of Jesus, like what happens to them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would point them to Revelation 19 and 20 and talk about the two resurrections from the dead and how there is, first of all, uh, a first resurrection of those who, who proclaim Christ, who, those, those who are called by his name will be caught up in the first resurrection. And then the second, it says that in Revelation 20, there, everyone is a universal kind of resurrection from the dead. Um, so I, I'd point them to those two chapters and have them go study those and read those and then come back and see me what, what follow-up questions they have. And then from there, I would say, okay, you know, um, like Romans 1, 20, is God revealed to all people through creation? Um, you know, is, is, is God revealed in what we call the general revelation, like Romans 2, 14, Paul's talking about that God has revealed all people um, through the light of conscience. And, and kind of go through that and, 
and unpack with them kind of this idea that um, every human being has fallen, yes, uh, but we have this we have this uh, self awareness. We can look out at the order of the universe and the created realm around us and say there has to be an intelligent designer and creator. And that should, if we're truthful with ourselves, lead us to seek him out. Hmm. Um, and that seeking out, um, you know, we have in our, our notes here, Revelation, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 4.29. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know all the answers to, to what happens to everyone, uh, you know, that hasn't professed faith and never heard the gospel where they will spend eternity. But I do know that God is just, and, and he is way more just than I am and way more yeah. um, equitable than I am in that, in that matter. So um, now I do, I do want to um, stress the urgency of sharing the gospel with people because, um, yeah, I, I think, I think the, the ideal human is a man that has been redeemed from his sins through the resurrection, through the death, burial, and resurrection, and the work of of Christ on the cross for us. So there is an urgent calling there at the same time. It, I don't want to yeah. diminish that by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, yeah, no, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I I do the same thing. I think I I've had been I've been asked this question many times, and so I'll go Romans one mm-hmm. twenty. It talks about you know God being revealed to us in the light of creation. Romans two fourteen mm-hmm. talks about the Gentiles who don't have the law are a law unto themselves. So mm-hmm. like we know something is right. We know something is wrong through the light of conscience. Right. And so the problem with the human race is not that we don't have an understanding or a sense of God. It is that according to Romans 1, 21 through 23, we all reject this knowledge of God and we rebel against him. It says that mm-hmm. although they knew God, they did not um, acknowledge him in they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So the reality, according to the book of Romans, whether this is popular for us or not, I mean, the, what the Bible says is it's not that some people have not heard about God. It's that they have rejected what they have heard and what has been revealed to them. And so, um, yeah, Deuteronomy 4.29 says, if you seek the Lord your God, you'll find him if you look from all your heart and all your soul. Everybody who's truly seeking after God will find God. (laughs) Mm -hmm. If someone truly desires to know God, God will make himself known. And then I could tell stories from um, some of the missions classes I took in college where people would talk about unreached people groups having dreams and visions. And it's pretty common in the Muslim world for uh, Muslims to have dreams about Isa, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that be the thing that leads them to faith in Christ. So. God will make himself known to people who are truly desiring to know him. Um, the truth is people are responsible to God for what God has revealed to them. Mm-hmm. And so God is a just God who is perfect in all of his judgments. So like this side of eternity, I have what the Bible tells me. I have the commission of Jesus. <laughs> You know, I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not God. So I'm not going to be the one judgment day that says this person spends eternity with God. This person doesn't, but I do know what God has said. And what God has said is that only by accepting God's grace to Jesus, people can be saved from their sins and rescued from the wrath of God. And so, um, I think we obviously, we've got to show some, uh, humility in, in some of that, but I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. I would say from the scriptures that man, every person needs Jesus. Every person needs the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think somehow that's getting lost? Like in this story, like some of the people that are Christians that kind of said, that guy's crazy. He should just left them alone. They're, they're not really thinking about it in this sense. Yeah. I think there was one pastor in particular in the film sounded really uh kind of postmodern kind of vibes uh talking about colonialism and and uh how he should have just left him alone yeah hmm. is that the guy that was an atheist no oh that was, was the, the other pastor. guy yeah i can't remember his name in the film but yeah 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 i think i remember that yeah 
Yeah. Well, and that's not to say yeah. that that missionaries haven't done their share of awful things. There's been some horrible things that people have done in the name mm-hmm. of. I mean, if you talk about like uh, what the Catholic Church did in South America and other places, forced conversions and stuff like that. I mean, it's pretty pretty crummy, pretty terrible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I understand why some people have like this nauseating, repulsing uh, response to hearing about missions, but um. Like here's where it gets tricky. If if we come to the assumption that the people that never hear the gospel are automatically saved and granted mercy from God, then the commission of Jesus to tell all the nations about the gospel makes no sense whatsoever. Hmm. We have no reason to go and tell the nations that have never heard of Jesus about Jesus if in the end they're going to end up with Jesus. So Jesus was giving us an absolutely unnecessary command. Yeah. And then we run into a very interesting and terrible problem. And that is if people who never hear the gospel are automatically saved, then it's logical to make sure that nobody ever hears the gospel because then there would be a chance they could reject the gospel and then be condemned. (laughs) (laughs) So as I think unpopular as this idea is for 2000 years, the reason that Christians have believed in missions, the reason there's been men and women like John Chow and Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and Adoniram Judson and um, trying to think of other famous missionaries. uh, It's because of this thing called the great commission. Like Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so, Mm. At some point in your Christian life, you got to ask yourself, am I being obedient to that or am I not being obedient to that? So, yeah, you've been to Uganda on mission. Was that a risk for you? Did you feel like that was a uh, something that maybe you weren't exactly... What was that like? What was the decision that led up to you deciding to go and do missions work there? Yeah, just a, just an inexplicable kind of heaviness and burden for for going uh it's something that you just can't can't let go can't get out of your mind um i remember my mom asking me you know leading up to my trip uh where you you know wh- where are you going again and and who do you know there and where are you staying and it's like i don't know i don't know i don't know <laughs> you know it's like I- i've never met anyone there i've never been there um the, even the person who is my point of contact i've never met in person so yeah it kind of all kind of dawned on me that yeah this is we're kind of going in this blindly and i remember getting there and it's like the middle of ramadan and a very heavily muslim populated area of uganda i'm like thinking wow i did not expect this this yeah. is crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. i remember the first night in a hotel just just being like uh you know i i feel completely like a fish out of water hearing the call to muslim call to prayer everywhere you go and yeah i mean it's there's risk involved um and you know, as a a father of two two boys at the time, or no, three boys at the time, and yeah, you you start to think about like, man, uh, if something happens to me here, you know, my boys are going to grow up without their father, and you start to weigh all this out. Um. Yeah, but then you know, you just you 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 trust on the the calling that's on your life, but also the the multitude of prayers that are behind you, but also there there's this um. A, a, a lot, a large um, amount of research that goes into it as well. And I know he did that with the Sentinelese people, but yeah. um, I know that these, I know that y- Ugandans are not going to threaten me with my life just for going to Uganda. Um, you know, I'm not going to storm into a mosque and start preaching the gospel in a mosque in the middle of a prayer service. Hmm. Um, that would be unwise to do, but you know, you could, you could open up dialogue with Muslim clerics you know at a mm-hmm. coffee house and you go sure. and you could do other things like that but yeah, yeah so i mean we're gonna trying to answer the question was what john chow did ethical um we could you know it's kind of part one and then part two i think we need to ask is was what john chow did wise because i think those are two different questions sure the film tries to answer basically and i'm grappling with yeah i mean i think we both can agree that like if you believe the bible and you take the words of Jesus serious, it's not the great suggestion, it's the great commission. So in some Mm -hmm. sense, we all have to be involved in this mission to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. 
that doesn't mean every one of us are going to go to the ends of the earth. Some of us are going to stay behind and pray and give and support. Um, but some of us will go. Some of us will go. Some of us will um, go on short-term mission trips. Some of us will go do evangelism on college campuses. Some of us will give our lives to nations and people groups and live over there and raise our kids over there. And I've got lots of friends who are doing that now and have done that. And, mm -hmm. and man, like the way that you are compelled to do that is the beauty of Christ and the burden you have for people to want to know him so they can be saved. Mm -hmm. And so John Shaw was willing to put his life on the line because he believed the words of Jesus. We can say what we want and wrestle about the ethics of it and the wisdom behind it. But I think as a person, you, you can't watch that and say he didn't truly believe this. And at least that part of his story is very admirable. But, um, so yeah, let's talk about the ethics of it. Like what he did was illegal. Indian government said no one's allowed to do it. So he broke the law, but not only break the law, he also implicated other people in breaking the law. He paid fishermen to take him to the island. They were arrested after his death. So he apparently was also putting lives at risk. He was putting his, his own life at risk. But according to a lot of anthropologists, he was putting the life of the North Sentinelese at risk because they would have lacked immunity to any pathogens he might have been carrying. Hmm. Um, and so the big question is, was it ethical for him to break the law, to trespass on other people's land, to endanger these people's lives and his own, to bring to them this gift that he believed they needed, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they didn't really understand and that they didn't really want. <laughs> So how do you answer that? I mean, I have no problem with like the law thing. Like we we would say someone's smuggling Bibles into North Korea, yeah. even though they're breaking the law. That's that's justified. Sure. So that's not a thing. I think I think potentially getting them sick with pathogens that would potentially wipe them out. I think that that's more problematic and a little bit more of a gray area than than just breaking Indian law. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, the the it's the thing is I haven't fully processed it yet and come to a conclusion of what he did was ethical. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, how else I could he have he, done it? You know, what I'm saying? yeah, like, yeah, he that's the thing. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe like maybe like dropping drone uh pictures and photos or presents or something, you know, and eventually yeah. kind of like building up. I I have no idea, but like that's kind of that's kind of what you know the. Nate Saint and Jim Elliott did was they stuff they drop stuff from the airplane, uh, you know, for for many days if not months leading up to their initial visit. Mm -hmm. Um. So I I don't know I, I I think what he did was was mostly ethical, uh, in the in terms of the kingdom, uh, code of conduct. Right. I think what he did was 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 mostly ethical. Yeah. Because you got to go to the book of Acts where the apostles were told you should never speak the name of Jesus. And they came together yeah. and said, we've got to obey God rather than men. Mm -hmm. We were told by God, by the Messiah, by Jesus to preach the gospel. So if Jesus said preach the gospel, the law of God overrules the law of man in that scenario. Mm hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, you've got Christians that are smuggling Bibles into closed off countries all over the world um, because the belief that we have as Christians is that all people need to hear. So, yeah, I think the ethics question is probably less on was it wrong for him to break the law and probably more um, the North Sentinelese getting them sick. And that's what's hard too, because I mean, he was vaccinated apparently and quarantined and he was trying to be at least somewhat cognizant of that mm -hmm. as he went over. So, yeah. So was what he did wise. Mm. Um, kind of a couple questions. <clears throat> he was going against the clearly expressed wishes of the Sentinelese and he was trespassing and invading their territory. 
So why should he have thought that if he just kayaked up on the beach, they would welcome him when other people had been driven away or killed? Hmm. So that's kind of, I think, a big question, right? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one could question. The I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't know. And again, I don't know that the the Great Commission calls us to do things that are constantly just in a self-preservation mode, like in Acts 14, where Paul gets stoned right to the brink of death in Iconium, and they actually drag him outside the city. Right. And then he gets back up and goes back into the city. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That We would say that that was unwise for him to do, because sure. there's people yeah. there that, oh, we, the, the, we shot that, we killed him, let's do a better job now. Um, so I think, I think sometimes we just make decisions if, you know, in terms of, being prompted by the Holy Spirit that are that 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 frankly will get us killed and mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah so I don't know well and that's what stuff uh, too is like if let, let's say let's say that the Holy Spirit truly prompted him to go to that island and he was trying to be as obedient to what he felt like was the Holy Spirit if that was the case which that's between John Chow and the Lord it might seem unwise to us but you know perhaps it was the Holy Spirit. Like you said, mm. you know, um, but one could also say from just like a missiologist perspective. Okay, so John Chow, if you had perhaps seen in this circumstance, God is closing the door right now. Maybe you go back to the capital of the Andaman Islands and you spend another year researching, praying, meeting with mm -hmm. experts in your field, thinking through, hey, I tried this, that didn't work. Maybe there's another approach that I could try so that, you know, over the course of the next 10, 15 years, we can slow walk this. I can be patient and I can recognize that like, okay, that door closed. So um, I'm going to be patient. Because mm -hmm. he really only had like a three year or excuse me, a three day <laughs> missionary mm -hmm. career to the Sentinelese. Maybe he could have been more. Right strategic and said, okay, my first attempt at contact didn't work. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to do kind of a post-mortem of my first attempt at contact. What didn't work? Let's try to figure this out for next time. So that's kind of what right, I was thinking. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think, I think, yeah, he should have done something like that. Uh, but here's, here's an interesting um, question though, that no one seemed to ask. If, even though he really didn't seem to make any inroads that we know of with these people in terms of sharing the gospel, if he hadn't done what he did and just stayed stateside or, or maybe had some missionary experience and wherever, um, would we be talking about these people and would we be talking about this 26-year-old kid with the selfless faith that he had? Hmm. And what has that done and what kind of ripples has that sent out into the world? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Absolutely. Like maybe the effect wasn't make inroads on his island. Maybe maybe the intended effect for the Holy Spirit and, and it's ultimately successful is everyone hear about John Chow's faith. Yeah. No, that's a really, really interesting thought. It's funny. I listened to, I went on a run today on my lunch break and I listened to an interview with the lady from... Um, all Nations, that organization out of Kansas City. Mm -hmm. uh, the podcast yeah. is called The Mission Matters, and the episode is called The Other Side of the Mission Documentary. And so um, they were interviewing her and asking her about John Chow, because she knew John Chow, worked with John Chow, trained John Chow, talked mm -hmm. with John Chow. And she said that there were so many people who had reached out to her and the missions organization in the years following his death, trying to get the film rights for this story. And she said, for years, we just kept telling them, no, 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 no. And she said, the reason is because we don't think the story is over. She said, we, we know because we read the back of the Bible, the book of revelation says that all nations will come before the throne. And she said, mm. so there is coming a day when the North Sentinelese hear the name of Jesus and are given a chance to respond to Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, man, that's a, that's a tremendous amount of faith 
mm-hmm. to say like what John Chow did was essentially put this people group on the map to say, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, there, there is, there is a call from the scriptures for us to go to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Now, the way that we do it matters. We got to be wise. We got to be ethical. We can't, you know, be colonialist or anything like that, which I don't think John Chow mm-hmm. was. Um, mm-hmm. But I think like you can't get around this if you really believe your Bible. Like you've got to get to a point where you go, either I believe this or I don't. Um, I think so much of the pushback on this is because there is a ideology that says all of humanity belongs to two groups. There's the oppressed and there's the oppressors. Mm -hmm. There is the ruling class and then there's everybody else. And Mm -hmm. basically this is social Marxism. And so according to this ideology, missionary work is a form of white supremacy and colonialism because we're bringing this white religion that's responsible for Western civilization. And we're imposing it on these, you know, people groups that are innocent and untainted and like an endangered species of animals. And who do we think we are doing that? You know? Um, Right. There was so much of that ideology presented. And I would just say like, if you really think that you really need to go back and read the history of like what the world was like before, Christianity came like if yeah. look at the nation of like Denmark, this is what one of the hosts on this other podcast was talking about. He said, I'm, I'm Danish. And he goes, and I, I've been reading about the history of my people, the Vikings. And before Christianity came to Denmark, what the Vikings took part in and part of their Norse worship was barbaric mm-hmm. and awful. And so Christianity came and put a stop to that stuff. And you can look at every yeah. place where Christianity came, and that's exactly what happened. It didn't take people backwards. It improved their life. It made their life better. It didn't make their life worse. Mm-hmm. So this is a false narrative that people are presenting that somehow what Christianity is is a, another attempt from an oppressive group to try to oppress people through an oppressive ideology. So I, I just think that's very interesting. And I totally saw that agenda in this documentary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to, uh, would you recommend somebody watch this? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah. It's, it's a really, really well done documentary. Um, yeah, it is. Man, production is, is really good. What's, what's interesting is you never see a video of John Chow talking. No thing. Mm-mm. That was that was odd to me. You know, there's a, someone, an actor, who is reading his diary or his journal throughout the film. Mm-hmm. But you never see a video of him talking. I wonder why that is. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Almost made it more. Um, I don't know. You had more of a respect for him. Yeah, because you kind of saw his heart in the most eloquent way because there was an actor reading it. You know. Right. Right. But according to a lot yeah, of the really, really well done. Yeah, according to a lot of missionaries that worked with him, he was very kind of unassuming, not the kind of person you would have expected to do something like this, but mm. yeah. Anyway. Well, cool. Gabe, there was a prediction that you said that you were going to, um, you were going to reveal on oh, this yeah. month's episode. Yeah. Did, did you oh, have that man. prediction? Do you want to pull it up? It was a year ago. Yeah. We did a, it's crazy. It's been a year already. We did an episode <laughs> on Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency, whether or not it's uh, something we should invest in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think you, we made prediction what Bitcoin would be in one year from recording that episode. Okay. And I think Bitcoin, at the time of recording that episode, I think it was around 17000 per Bitcoin. Okay. Um, I predicted it would double. And what did you predict it would be? I can't remember. I don't remember at all. No, <laughs> I should have. I should have pulled up the audio. Um, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, maybe we should go back and listen to it. I think, I think you predicted it would be about half of 
of what it was at the time of recording. So half. So I predicted it would lose its value. You predicted it would double its value. Yeah, yeah. So right now it's it's actually dropped a little bit the past few days, but right now it's sitting at almost forty one thousand dollars at the time of recording. Holy this. cow! Yeah. So. I remember saying, I was like, but don't invest based on what I'm predicting. <laughs> <saying> that, <laughs> that was like, Man, I wish I had uh, put my life savings in Bitcoins. I could have doubled it, God more wait. than doubled it. But yeah, it's crazy. It's just, it's just nuts. If only people took our investment strategy serious. <clears throat> yeah. So mm. if you're listening to this in 2024, the cost of... Yeah. Yeah, tasty ego waffles. That's the new thing to invest in. Tasty <laughs> ego waffles. Who would have thunk it? Who would have oh, thunk I see it? my uh, my candles are burned down back there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I hear the the natives are getting restless upstairs. Yes. Yeah, speaking oh, of speaking wow. of natives, that's is that too soon? Yeah. Wow. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, wow. maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Anyway, it did not. That pun There's, was not intended. At oh, all. well, okay. I, that, you're forgiven. It's all right. So, mm. yeah. Well, thank you guys for listening. And if you have any questions or if you've watched the documentary and you want to make a comment or an observation, we'd love to hear it. Uh, Bears about the podcast at gmail.com. You can leave us a comment on the YouTube video or send us a message on Facebook. But thank you for listening. And we'll see you guys next time and invest everything you have in tasty waffles. <laughs>well thanks for listening that's our show if you like what you've heard make sure to give us a share leave us a review or send us an email at beardsandbiblepodcast at gmail.com